So we invited two outstanding experts to share their knowledge. This is Vicente Gualart from Barcelona and Elke Krasny from Vienna. They will first hold the presentations referring to their books, The Self-Sufficient City from Vicente Gualart. You can see it here. Yes, you can. And then from Elke Krasny, this is the book Critical Care. After their presentations, um, they will use the time to be in a conversation to deepen the issue and to challenging each other. So now I have the great pleasure to introduce our guests who both have confirmed our invitation, very enthusiastic. And we hope that our internet connection is also in the same way enthusiastic as they are. So um, Elke Krasny, I have to take the right paper. She is professor at the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna and head of the Department of Education in Arts. With her research, the academic writings and the curatorial work, she addresses questions of care at the present of historical situation. She is having focus on practices in art, curating, architecture and urbanism. In the last year, 2019, she created together with Angelika Fitz the exhibition Critical Care, Architecture and Urbanism for a Broken Planet. They edited the book with the same title that was published by MIT Press. They are addressing the human-made environmental and social catastrophes, as we will hear it from Vicente as well afterwards. By presenting 21 current projects in the exhibition, Critical care proves that architecture and urbanism can bring the planet back to life. So, dear Elke, I'm looking forward to hear from you your findings, how to, get, to care about our cities and how the planet can be brought back to life. Okay. So, we are back, um, three of us here in the screen, because we obviously have some problems with the uh, um, connection to Elke. And until we go there, I'd like to introduce Vicente in this time now in between, so we can bridge the time a little bit and, and um, go further on afterwards. So uh, Vicente Ballard, um, will present his concept of a self-sufficient city later on. He is former chief architect of Barcelona and, and founder of Gallard Architects and also founder of the IAAC. This is the Institute of Advanced Architecture in Catalonia. In his work as an architect, he is a pioneer of interaction between nature, technology and architecture. He spent part of his time with research and educational projects. He won numerous prizes, participated at exhibitions, teached at different universities all over the world, and he was publishing various books. So you see, it's a lot, a lot, and I don't go to the details because otherwise um, the hour is over. But it was grabbing my attention this summer when his office won the international competition for the design of a post-corona mixed-use community in China. There I was reading this quote of Vicente. Our proposal stems from the need to provide solutions to the various crises that are taking place in our planet at the same time. So that was really appealing. They are thinking about solutions for the city that can uh, giving answers to different crises, all all of crises in the best case that occur to our um, to our planet. So, um, therefore, he came up with a proposal um, of a self sufficient city, and he used the same title for this project as his book is having that was published in the year 2014. So that was the point when we finally thought we will ask him to present his book and his idea about a self-sufficient city. 
So maybe Vicente, you could you could start to explain um, your concept of the self-sufficient city without your presentation. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, I can do it. Uh, I can still so show your book. Well, this is you know the story is a bit more complex because in fact there are two books with similar names that one is from a competition within the year 2008 trying with, uh, mm -hmm. with IAC but then uh, I wrote another book that in fact uh, the title is The Cells of the City that one uh, it was written when well w w after the crisis of 2008 uh, and also mm -hmm. when we start to feel that this boom that uh, finished with the Lehman Brothers felt uh, we should rethink how we make cities and how we run our cities so far. So from that point of view, uh, I, I mean, the most important thing is today we live in a city where we import everything that we, we consume. So we bring energy, we bring products. So sometimes we cut a tree in Africa, we send the tree to China. In China, they make a table and then we buy the table in Barcelona. It doesn't make sense, you know, because at the end, um, at the end of the 90s, we thought uh, that uh, the developed countries should not produce anymore. We should just design or and program, and then there should be someone else producing things. To produce things was something that we thought was not relevant at all. And right now, when we have crisis, we realize that it's important to, to be able to have control of what we do. This is one thing. And second thing is that the rate of unemployed people People in cities like Barcelona, for young people especially, is 45 percent. You know, so that means that we 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 decide not to make anything because we thought we were rich, and then we decide that someone else should be doing. And our proposal is that the cities should be productive again. We should start to produce food, energy, and things in the cities, and that's why we came with the idea of making cities that are zero emission cities. Uh, this was our mantra when I was working in the city council and right now what what is interesting is that this is a mantra for the whole european union that want to become a, a continent of zero emissions and even in china they they say they want to be a zero emissions continent by 2060. so that means that that mantra that came from our research and the, the vision that we should really start to produce things, including energy and, and food in the cities, now is, is becoming uh, something that is becoming a, a general strategy. And during this crisis, I mean, we were we thought that we were immersed in the crisis for the climate, but suddenly we realized that we are really so fragile that we are now in lockdown uh, in our homes. That's why we do this kind of conference in this way. And, uh, and then we realized that we should, uh, I mean, we should rethink how we make things after the crisis. And you know, the, in my presentation, we hope we'll be ready because I already sent it and I hope you receive it. Um, you know, we are exactly like 100 years ago. Uh, it was the moment when the so-called Spanish flu was over. And this is the moment also when the Bauhaus was you know, it was a moment of crisis where we should rethink everything. So we have one of these crises every 50 years. The, the, after in the 70s, we have a similar crisis. I would say that one was very clear about the energy, but also a cultural crisis. And right now, the good news is that we should use this crisis in a similar way, uh, like in the 20s, when it was one of the most creative moments during the 20th century. And it looks like we can have the presentation of Vicente now, as he already started. Good. So, yeah, my presentation, I, I like to have a mm, presentation with a lot of images. So even if I have 10 minutes, I will be sharp with the 10 minutes, but I will, I will say many times next. So let's start with the next thing. And I will be talking today about this competition, this project we won in China. Next, please. Yeah, that, that was a competition for four blocks in a city. Next, please. 
in Xi'an is a new city near Beijing. It's a city for uh, one million people. Next, and 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 then uh, that it was plan uh, following new forms of urban planning, more ecological and more using European patterns. Next. Today in China, housing is like this. Still, the socialists, in fact, this is the modern, uh, the modern one is invented in the 20s, in the 1920s by the Le Corbusier and his friends. Next, that has produced Next, this industrial model of city, a city that, that basically received goods and produced emissions and produced trash. Next, our idea is to make a bio cities. Next, where the city and the forest merge, where, please, next, where cities, in fact, they are, are uh, eating or uh, absorbing CO2 and we use and we use the wood as material. Next. As I said, this is 100 years ago, the Spanish flu. Next. Next. And also, it was the moment when the Bauhaus was founded. Next. So you see the architecture at the Bauhaus. This is the Siedlung in Stuttgart. Sorry, back. Uh, you see that it was the big windows, ventilation. So this was answering that crisis uh, uh, that they had in that moment. Next. Yeah, this is 1950s uh, terrace building. Next. So this is our project for showing there were four blocks. Next. And then the topic was to create different uh, uh, levels of privacy from more private at home and the building, the the block, the neighborhood, and so on. Next, our proposal was to merge traditional blocks with the more dense uh, Chinese blocks, and, and then the greenhouses. Next, uh, next, yeah. So we propose to have greenhouses on top of the buildings and to make the buildings complete food in order to be able to produce food, energy, and things in our buildings. Next. Yeah, next. Yeah, this is about the mobility, developing the mobility. Next. The Koryas, the Koryas are more like the European blocks that this is very unique in China. Next. And then we were discussing that our we should be able to work at home, but also to co-work and develop other forms of working. Next. And that's why these images should near our home in order to uh, to be able, when we are able to go outside, to be working in places like this. Next. But also in the next home, they're able to work at home. And this is what we learned we should be doing. I mean, around 60% of population can work at, and then this is something that will become more uh, usual. Next. And also education at home will be so next. Our idea for the future should be that we should be able to produce things locally while we are connected globally. So this is the new form of capitalism that is not based on producing in cheap places in, in third world and then importing food to the first world. We should be able to produce everywhere around the world while we are connected uh, globally with information networks. Until now, we see that the connectivity is working, but now we need to start to produce in things in cities. So this is the general metabolic vision about cities. Go next, and I will explain you this. So we include also data management in our neighborhood, in our project, and also the idea of the next, please. Yeah, trash management with different uh, classification, next. Yeah, and then the green production, next. Because, uh, yeah, one something fundamental is to use of wood. And connecting with this, go next, I want to share two minutes, the idea of the CLT, that is the new material for the 21st century. 19th century was steel, 20th century was concrete, 21st century we need to use material that already has CO2 inside, like uh, uh, cross-laminated timber. Next. 
And then in Barcelona, we are, this is a sample of one of the buildings. Next. Next. And in Barcelona, we are next, we are developed, we have a research center next, where we develop research with our students. This is Barcelona, you see here, this is our lab in the middle of the forest. In that lab, next, uh, we, we have an holistic vision, next. And then our students of architecture produce food, next. We should produce food. Yeah, we have this laboratory, next. And then we have machines to do digital fabrication, next. And then we do forest management, for sustainable forest management. And then we cut some trees every year. And then with the tree next, we produce some trunk with full traceability. We produce our timber next. With the timber, we produce CLT. And with the CLT, this summer, we were producing a home. You see this uh, quarantine cabin using uh, the wood that was produced from our forest. So you see that we, uh, and this is the idea we wanted to apply to our building next, where we were using that wood and then the, the facade and the structure will be done with wood next. Yeah, and, and you will see now where this is a regular plan next, next. Yeah, where we have also public facilities, we have the courtyards next. All the buildings has terraces, next. And then with this idea, next, our idea is to go to basics, making buildings that produce energy, food, and things, next. I saw this sample in Iceland, next, next please, where the greenhouses, in Iceland, they are producing tomatoes in greenhouses, in this frozen, let's say, country, next. Our idea, we should be, this is New York also. Our idea in our project was to have greenhouses everywhere where the citizens next will able to produce next, uh, produce food in the rooftop. So every building should be able to produce food and also every citizen should produce food in their own building. Uh, and this in other kind of crisis will be great, also including market and also to produce energy. This is sample from Barcelona. But then instead to have an isolated pergola, our idea was to have an integrated production of food, of energy, go next please, uh, in every uh, roof. So our building will produce 80% uh, of the energy that they need. Uh, go next please. And also we'll produce, we'll have 3D printers in the ground floor because during the pandemics, we were not able to provide our mask. Uh, and then what we start to do in Barcelona and I, I suppose all over Europe is to start to use 3D printing uh, uh, to produce masks, go next, to save life of people. So during crisis is when we see what we are able to do. If we were not able to buy masks to China, we should have buildings that produce uh, things in the building themselves. Also, we have uh, buildings with terraces, apartments with terraces, that is something fundamental to create this climate comfort, but also to have an expansion. It's an expanded apartment idea. So sorry, because it was a bit chaotic, because there were many images in few time, but our idea was to produce buildings that are made with wood, that are empowering the people. Our, the idea for the future is ecology will be based in making cities that are more like, I would say, like the nature, where we produce things instead to consume things. Uh, we don't want to import things from all over the world. We want to empower the people uh, around the place where they live. This is our proposal. Thank you. It is just good to scroll through. Thank you very much. So now we go back to Elke and we hope that uh, we get uh, your voice now clear. Uh, I hope you can hear me um, over the phone. Okay, so you want me to start all over again? Yeah, that's Okay, dann gehen wir gleich zum nächsten Slide. 
So what I uh, had started to share was that irrespective of the way political, economic and social life is organized in any historical social formation, care is indispensable to human existence. Um, throughout our lives as humans, um, we are dependent upon care, but we are also giving care. And um, Angelica Fitz and myself as curators and editors were interested to understand how architecture can be understood through the lens of care, both giving care, but also um, having to receive care, being in need of care. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Um, on the most general level, John Tronto and Berenice Fisher, two theorists of care suggests that caring be viewed as a species activity that includes everything we, and they speak about humans, do to maintain, continue and repair our world so that we can live in it as well as possible. That world includes our bodies, ourselves and our environment, all of which we seek to interweave in a complex life-sustaining web. This uh, very broad definition of care is useful to apply to architecture as we can see here that bodies and environment are intersected by the way in which architecture takes care of both human bodies but also um, the environment. Can we go to the next slide please? As we all know, architecture and urbanism are entangled in building capitalism. So the, the history of capitalism is the history of architecture, as Peggy Dima has rightly pointed out. And therefore, architecture is also fully implicated in what is referred to as the capitalocene. But starting from the given, from the broken condition um, of our planet, um, Starting from this, architecture and urbanism can, could, and hopefully will be become part of the solution. And uh, what I find interesting when we think about architecture and urbanism, that it's about building relations of care at all scales, from the individual um, house or building to the, the global condition of uh, infrastructural networks. Can we go to the next slide, please? Critical Care, Architecture and Urbanism for a Broken Planet is the book that Angelica Fitz and myself edited. It includes 21 examples, current examples of realized architecture, most of them um, long-term and intersecting, complexly intersecting economy, ecology um, and labor. Can we go to the next slide, please? Out of these 21 examples, I'm sharing just a few here. Um, the first one is the making better of an existing building, 530 apartments um, in Bordeaux that were transformed by Lacaton Vassal together with uh, Frédéric Triot and Christophe Utah, making the apartments more generous, but also bringing down the, the cost um, for energy. So the cost in terms of money spent, but also the cost on the environment. And this also shows how to live with the very often not well kept legacies of, of modernism. So it looks at the site where architecture is in need of care, needs to be repaired in order to fulfill the tasks of caregiving. Can we go to the next slide, please? Yasmin Lari, a Pakistani architect, um, together with the Heritage Foundation of Pakistan, which she founded and runs together with her husband, has been active for the Sindh flood rehabilitation project in the Sindh region in Pakistan, which is characterized by recurrent flooding. And here we see uh, what is commonly referred to as self-help building. She set up a whole infrastructure of education where NGOs, women and run NGOs, 
um, educate people in building skills, building techniques that are actually gleaned from heritage technologies, update those um, to current uh, conditions, and make it possible for people to live with the flood. And it's also counteracting the internationalized, globalized aid industry that very often doesn't benefit local condition, but only benefits globalized capital. Can we go to the next slide, please? The third example I'm sharing today is an example um, that actually operates um, on the urban scale and uh, has for the first time introduced the model of the community land trust to an entire neighborhood, making um, this land managed, self-managed by the neighborhood, therefore taking it out of gentrification pressures that had risen uh, due to the fact that the financial district in um, um, San, Juan, San Juan, Puerto Rico, where this case study is located, had encroached on the informal settlement and therefore endangered um, people with displacement and eviction. And at the same time, this project also included um, ecological repair of the uh, Martin Peña Canal and bringing together um, ecology economy and new forms of collectively organized labor also around community gardens as we see here urban um, agriculture as we see here uh, in this image is one of the most promising examples of making cities operate not outside of capitalism but with a different economy within capitalism can we go to the next slide, please? This is one image that shows you the exhibition as it was installed at the Architecture Center in Vienna. And Angelica and I are very happy that this exhibition has now started um, to travel and that there um, is hopefully growing interest to share and show these examples elsewhere so they can contribute to learning from case studies that seek to make architecture a life-making practice. Can we go to the next slide? Caring architecture is situated at the politics of interdependence, how bodies and the environment are interdependent for not only well-being, but actually survival. And this, as I said before, is um, based, rooted in the interconnectedness of economy, ecology, and labor. This being a given, care comes in when these interconnections are being taken care of in a, in a way that doesn't conform to the exploitative uh, politics of capitalism or state violence. Can we go to the next slide, please? I also wanted to bring in the most current um, experiences of care being everywhere. So when Angelica and I started working on this exhibition in 2016, we were, of course, years before the pandemic. Um, so we borrowed critical care from the medical context in order to develop a new lens um, for thinking about architecture, not as a new style or not as a new ism, but as an um, ethical perspective of bringing economy, ecology and labor together differently. Today, with the um, global pandemic ongoing and many cities under lockdown conditions, not only has care become the main feature, um, the central um, element that keeps humans alive and is being talked about um, by politicians, by the economy and many others, but it also makes very apparent that caring architecture 
is what contributes to the well-being and the livelihoods of those who have access to it, but also makes very clear that those who do not have access to shelter are very much more vulnerabilized and much more um, exposed to the virus. As many have pointed out, it's not the virus that discriminates, it's systems that discriminate. And here I wanted to share another um Okay, you were already able to read the quote, and I want to end with care understood as a global public good and hopefully working toward a new global care imaginary um, through which architecture and urbanism will and can be practiced differently. Thank you for, um, for making it possible technologically, David, that I could share the presentation, uh, and this is the last slide now. Thank you very much, Elke. Now we heard everything and we saw everything. It was great. So um, I really appreciate to have your two presentations. And now I invite you, Elke, to put your first question to Vicente to start your conversation. Did you hear me, Elke? I think you asked me to ask a question. Yes. <laughs> okay. So what I had wanted to ask after the really impressive presentation by Vicente was about the building no longer being an object. What really struck me is that um, there was not this notion of considering a building isolated from other buildings, which has um, very often been the case in, let's say, architecture as business as usual, but that the building became an infrastructural node together with other networks. And we saw that this clearly involved um, humans and what they do but also plants and, and agriculture. And, and I would very, I mean, I was really impressed by that and would very much um, like to ask you to expand more on the, let's say the productive building or the building that produces rather than consumes. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, I, I, I show what that drawing uh, where we see one of our ancestors, you know, our ancestors were living in caves and they were our grand, 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 grandfathers. That means that uh, at some point they were looking for the basic thing that they need to live. They were making fire, they were hunting, they were making tools. So now that we are, we have been in lockdown, uh, we saw how much important is these very basic things, no? To have like food, to receive energy, and these kind of things that in general, we don't have any kind of control or information where things are coming from. But in general, in this globalized world, uh, we give this like, uh, a fact that in Germany you you have gas and obviously the gas is coming from Russia and maybe this has some political uh, e exchange no so I would say that today in this globalized world the fact that we receive oil from the Middle East we receive mask uh, chirurgical mask from China or we we receive products from all over the world make us really very fragile and uh, i think that part of the um, climate crisis is based on this kind of globalization where every time that we want a bit of bread there is a huge amount of oil inside the the flavor uh, because maybe it was produced somewhere in, in America or in South America or whatever. So I think that uh, during the 20th century, Le Corbusier was talking about this machine of living. And now we should go beyond the machine and we should talk about the organism of living. In this organism, 
Le uh, Corbusier was talking about the uh, buildings that have air conditioning that are consuming energy and they, they are producing their own air. But now we see that the quality of the air in our cities is really is killing people. We see and because we, we have we spend too much energy. So yes, it's true that we should create cities that instead to emit CO2, they absorb CO2. Then this will be a smart cities. This, this will be really a proof that we are becoming uh, a civilization. We are becoming civilized because right now we have cities where uh, that are full of cars, that they are emitting CO2, that we need to spend one hour to go to work and another hour to go back to work. So we should make a list of the things that how we would like to live. And this is what I did. You know, when we were doing this competition, we were in lockdown here in Barcelona. And then really we were trying to express everything that we would like to have in our cities, that this is more than logical, no? Walk to work, buying fresh bread that is produced in the corner, being able to produce a lectures in the rooftop, having solar energy in our building. And then that means that, yes, uh, the idea of the building as an object disappear, and we think more in the idea of the urban habitat. We build an habitat. Uh, we don't live anymore in caves. Uh, we can create infrastructure for our living. And this is what I think we should do uh, for our uh, near future. So thank you very much for giving um, this answer. I think it's really a critical question what you were asking, Elke, because many architects are having difficulties to adopt to these topics because they still want to make objects. They want to make, the, how you said, they, they want to make this house and this building. And so so where do you see, Winchen, where do you see the, the, this, this um, how to say this purpose of architects that they they really want to to design spaces that they want to design spaces in a way that people feel comfortable and all these architectural topics how do you how do, how does these two things coming together like all the the urban machine and and the the, the need of of designing our our environment of designing the spaces in a way that we that humans feel comfortable you know i was a student of architecture in the 80s we were reading Mies van der rohe and le corbusier and find your right and others and then at that moment uh, but in the 80s we have the postmodernism that was the summit of the objects and this recreation on the folklore no about the history not making things real it was a kind of excess of everything and i was dreaming that it would be great to be in the middle of this uh, modern architecture revolution that was defining the rules for the next 50 years this is where we are now now we are exactly in that moment where we have new materials. Uh, we have uh, like the glass that was using Peter, uh, that was using uh, Walter Gropius to design the factories or the concrete. Now we need to define the rules of, uh, of cities that promote life. I mean, uh, like as Elke was saying, cities that care that they care about the people, you know, and and because we are an intelligent civilization, we should really define what are the new elements that we want to put in place in our cities. And as I say now, after crisis is the moment when we can accelerate the future because we have suffered. We have seen, you know, when we were thinking that we could be living uh, imagine that someone told you uh, one year ago, you can live in a lockdown in your home without leaving your city for three months. You would think that this was impossible. And now that we have seen how many things that seems to be impossible has become possible, uh, is the moment where we need to define the rules for the new cities and the new architecture. 
And I think that uh, the idea that we define a living that create a community. For me, the key point is you can live isolated in the countryside, that's okay. But if you want to live in the city, we need to build communities and we really need to work together to define the rule for these communities. A city is a miracle. You know, you see, well, you see a city is a miracle. Americans, they don't love cities because they love guns. And if you trespass their home, they can shoot you. So this is a culture that obviously we should avoid because we, as you, we, uh, we want to live together. And from that point of view, every 50 years, we, redis we redefine the rules to make cities. And this is what is going to happen now. OK, now to, we have um, not that much time left. But Elke, do you have a second question for uh, Vicente? Or do we want to make it the other way around? Who is going to ask the next one? I, mean, I think I'm less optimistic. Uh, so I would say there was a lot of pandemic solidarity at, at the very beginning of the outbreak of the of the coronavirus, uh, of the, the the global virus. And I think last so so in in March April, um, I was following um, the, the ways in which ad hoc. Um, communities of solidarity were being formed and and I would probably have shared the optimism that Vicente was um, was now uh, speaking about or speaking to I think what we are also witnessing is that um, there is um, increased um, violence and aggression precisely because of the pandemic and 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 much more um, so I think we need to understand, not, not we, but as humans, it is important to understand better the connections between social distancing and, um, and aggression and new forms of um, populist, um, extremist uh, politics that, that take advantage of what is happening. And, and so for this, I'm... I'm less optimistic um, now than I was before when it comes to to making these claims to building toward the future or building that there will actually be a future. Um, so it's more a remark than 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 a question. But um, but I think in this architecture is extremely powerful not powerful only in representing power but in giving agency and so i guess in order to work toward a question it would be using the bauhaus image in order to think about what, what kind of architecture education do we need because you showed that your students are actually working so they go full cycle in what they do and um and maybe this is since I'm also in 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 the university, um, yeah, I think I would like to ask something about education and what kind of architectural education one should think of and one should dream of in order to create pandemic solidarities for non-pandemic futures. Yeah, um, I will. And well, again, it is normal that we can be not optimistic. If we are, if we imagine what happened 100 years ago, in 10 years, there will be parties that this nationalism is transforming into something harder. And I think that because, uh, I mean, we should remember in order not to forget and try to start to fight against this kind of uh situation that we have seen so much in america in the uk many places in europe and other places so i think that we are in front of that challenge and that's why i think we need to be proactive not to become pessimist i, I prefer to be proactive from the point of view of the education 
I think that now uh, in the architecture field, architects, we have been always designers that were working for someone else. Now I am really very much interested on how architects become entrepreneurs, how our architects can be part of this startup culture, where instead to wait for the right client in order to do the right thing, they are thinking to create their own uh, company and their own initiative. They are uh, looking for the resources in order to make their ideas real. This is what we are learning also from Elon Musk and from other entrepreneurs that instead to wait for the right commission, they, be, they create the new kind of industry. And I think that this is something we should really be taking care about the idea that architects, instead to be just service providers, we are also becoming more entrepreneurs where we can really transform our reality in a more proactive situation. Um, this, what you just say now, just um, follows a question that we can read in the in the live chat in the YouTube stream, because there somebody is asking, and um, I would like to ask, where can we start as architects to assume this change in our designs? What would be the baby steps if they exist, of course? What would be your answer for that? Yeah, my answer will don't be afraid try to be rational, try to beat for the future. Don't think on the form only, think on the performance, think on what we want to, uh, uh, to do in order to find the solution. So we architects, we are very necessary right now. We are really, we, are, we, we will have more work than ever if we are able to follow and to be in the middle of these new uh, let's say situations where the future not only need to be invented, but need to be built. So from that point of view, we need to uh, not looking for the form, but looking for the performance, looking for the solutions, and then try to represent through design these uh, solutions that the society may we will need. Perfect. So thank you very much, Vicente. We have. Just one more minute left. Elke, do you want to have a last sentence for us? I think the question that was just asked is really an important question. I mean, what can one do? So I, I don't think that pessimism necessarily leads to not being active. Um, I, I just think that optimism sometimes um, leads to being um, overly confident of what things can do and so i would say a more cautious approach to to what it means to build in order for there to be a future and in order for there to be these kinds of different economies that were being spoken about but also in understanding that more than one type of knowledge is being needed to come together to create that I think this is what I would like for people, for all of us to, to learn how to think with all kinds of knowledges in plural in order to make um, futurity something that can happen and not the claim that architecture built the future, but that architecture can become part of building something that will make future possible. Thank you very much. So there's no, not really time to, time left. I really have a huge thank you to you both to make it possible and to share your thoughts and your knowledge. It's really, really appreciated. And um, I wish all of us having a great end of the festival. There are like three hours left. So we're almost there and we really want to enjoy the last hours. Thank you for having stay with us. Bye Vicente. Bye Elke. Okay.